Thank you so much for attending the Wind Race and Shelter Belt session. I'm Billy, I'll be the moderator for this. Uh, we've got 20 minutes for a talk, five minutes for Q&A, and a five minute period for room switch. So uh, I'll probably shut the questions off in 25 minutes, and then afterwards, everybody's here, we'll free to talk. So thanks for the license. Uh, please welcome William Ballesteros from the University of Nebraska. He will be talking about potential direct carbon storage by windbreaks on U.S. agricultural lands. William? Thanks. Uh, Dr. Blandon talk about the indirect effects of windbreaks on agricultural lands. We are talking about the direct effects of this windbreak. These two uh, research made part of the one big project titled uh, Carbon Free Potential the Green Bay on the United States, sponsored by NRCS. Uh, we know that Green Bay have a lot of potential for storage carbon in the United States. This potential is from 3 to 11 petagrams per year. But the problem with this estimate is that we have very, very limited data for generalization. That means that if we are using the same uh, information that some very uh, foolish and I repeating the same information and doing this analysis. And the other thing is that we need uh, tools for inform decision makers how these things they are working in the field in the agricultural lands. But wind brakes don't conform standard to the model. We can apply the uh, forest basic models to wind bay because wind bay have more open trees, this open trees have more biomass. For this reason we have few models for estimate carbon storage potential of the wind bay. That's why we wanted to develop one model easy to use for estimating carbon storage for wind bays. Uh, in the method, we make uh, data collection and preparation. We use forest trees from Montana and um, Nebraska and use the FIA data in the ecoregions 331 and 332 and explain the ecoregions later on in this presentation. For fixing this equation, we use all the protocol for regression models from from local models to validation, but in the validation process, we use Jenkins for testing Jenkins coefficients on, on the Rosa Pine, Jenkins coefficient for pines, we apply this coefficient for the Rosa Pine, and then we estimate the mass storage potential for wind vapor species in nine regions using FIA data, let us say. This is the same region that Dr. Bando showed you. We don't, don't study, we, we didn't study Southeast and uh, Southeast and Pacific. Pacific and Southeast. We only use these nine regions for, that, for making that uh, calculation. This is the Korea I am talking about. Uh, the Korea 331 and 332, all the Korea for the continental USA. One question is why we are using allometric? Allometric <coughs> for our study in agroforestry is very easy to use and when we fern trees we develop this equation and we continue applying this equation without falling or uh, cutting down more trees. That's the good thing for allometric because this is very, very, very easy to, uh, easy to use and allow follow-up measurements and estimate um, biomass based on TBH and can be applied to our uh, course in this case. Okay, when we analyze that uh, 18 trees, 
we develop two equations. One equation based on deviation height, another equation based on only on deviation. For that example, I am showing you only the equation based on deviation and height. When we analyze the residuals for testing linearity, we in this equation, in this in this variable, this deviation, we have this pattern, like a pattern pattern with this observation. But we have we have we have a uh, we uh, very nice scattering pattern. We don't have concern with high quality And then when we analyze the outliers, uh, looking for two or three standard deviations from the mean, we don't have any concern with the variable. We don't have observation beyond that bound. And then for normality, we have very nice shape for normality with uh, some skew in this observation. But in the cuckoo plot, we have problems with lower and upper tails. We have some departures from normality. That means that our data doesn't follow the assumption of normality. <coughs> and when we apply the cost cost transformation, cost cost transformation is what made us the light easy. That means that with this transformation, we can uh, raise the response variable to one value and deal with the conserved for normality. In this case, this cost uh, cost transformation says that we have to raise biomass to 0.4. Um, 0.4 is very close to 0.5. 0.5 is the square root. For the reason we transform the response variable to the square root. And uh, after that, we got a very nice plot for linearity. You can see for this uh, residual, you can see very scattered plots and no concerns with Outliers, and then nice shape for shape for normality, and the cuckoo plot says that okay, we made one good adjustment for lower tail, but upper tail has some departures. But fortunately, our interval in the cross cox contain one. That means that if any variable rise to the power of one, in the same variable, you will need more transformation, okay? We have, in that, in that case, two, that's case, two models. One model based on DVAs, another model based on DVAs and height. For literature, we found a lot of models, a lot of models, but we decided to use 13 models because these models are uh, adjusting very well to the range of data. So we plot this model here in the, our data. We see that the, these models make very good job. Now we have 13 models for literature and two models for local equation, for local, yeah, local data. All of these models were evaluated with six information criteria. Many people say, okay, you can use only two or three of this for this information criteria, but we want to be very strict with the most uh, criteria for be sure that the, these results are very, are, are very accurate. We use a just year square, the single standard error, a kind information criteria, the predict the single sum square, Variance inflation factor and for newer index. This index allows us to evaluate uh, models when we have transformed transform response variable. That means that if we transform, for <coughs> example, log, log transformation for some variables, all the information is log based. And for newer index 
allows us to transform back and analyze this data. Our results for these 15 models, we select five models with the best indexes for the different criteria. But we have one concern with the NAC model, have very good universal index and very good other criteria, but have very high variance inflation factor. That means that the, this model is repeating information have many variables that are repeating the same information. So this reason we discard that model. When we plot again that five models, we got this curve, very nice curve, all the models are together. And in this plot, we include Jenkins. Let's see here. Jenkins is doing a good job. Jenkins coefficient. Then we made a validation of those models and we use seven clean trees for training and one tree for testing. This tree was randomly selected. We select one tree and randomly and use the 17 trees for the log the coefficients. We made this six times, and we have six trees randomly selected and 17 trees predicting this. Uh, biomass, and this is the average error in cost field. We have no error with the model with the below uh, deviation basic and deviation height, very low. But surprisingly, Jenkins <coughs> had the lowest error in the estimate. That means Jenkins is doing a good, very good job. That's why we decide to select three models. DBAs, DBAs and height, and Jenkins. Jenkins is a very comprehensive model that can be applied for the, for the United States. That means that we have a huge potential with this equation. That's why we decide to use Jenkins and this model to test in different places and with different data. This is for FIA in these regions. And we have this, you can see very close values in the three models. So from the Rosa Pine, very close. And Jenkins has the advantage that the Jenkins is for the entire United States. We take a risk and use Jenkins coefficients in the for different species group in the West End. In this case, for half, in this case, for softwood, we have the coefficients. The same for hardwood, different species group, the coefficient. And we select uh, 16 species, A hardwood and A softwood. We know that these three, some things growing well in some regions, some things Growing, not going well, and it doesn't growing well on the regions. But we assume that the people are planting the right trees in the right place. And when we analyze all of these trees with Jenkins, we got this potential, which is megagram of carbon per hectare per year for hardware school spaces on the Green Bay design. We have for no lake, this value for hardwood, sawwood, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, we don't have available data for Rocky Mountain South. We have to work in that part to make this estimate. And that's it. We appreciate that National University for support this research. Right. Thanks, William. <laughs> We've got quite a bit of time for questions, so. So your validation trees, you collected from the same site where you collected your samples for developing the models? Yeah, the, were the same thing we collected in the beginning. 
collect uh, history, but because the sample size was very small, we need to we had to use the same trees for make the validation. We use 17 trees for the lot the equation or the coefficient and predict one tree. And then select another tree, use the 17 trees again, and predict the same. It is a small sample size. But the, you're injecting some bias in there. In other words, when you're validating a model, you should be applying it in another side. And you know, to test whether your model works yeah. for the yeah, range of our size. We use the Ecorigion 331 and 332. I show you this Ecorigion that they be. We have this data here. Different trees, different sites. Yeah. When, when you were developing your model, did, did you use sample trees? Was it out of the same windrow? Or did you decide you had random shoulder belts mm -hmm. that you assign numbers to it? Or you take, uh, assign uh, random numbers and then select for just trees in one particular belt? Or did you do yeah. a, a, that an array of, of uh, random numbers across the random trees across several shelter belts? Yeah. In different reads, we we or just one read. We wanted to, to make all of this stuff because we can select any tree in different region. But the problem with this kind of procedure is that this shelter bear have all it, and you can say, okay, this is the tree we want to cut. They say, no, no, don't cut this tree because it's too big. Cut this tree. We have to move in that way because it's not our. No penalty, that's three, we have four net. And yeah, you are right. We had to use random number to select every three and every video, but that's not possible. Let, let me help William out because a previous study collected the data. He did not go out to Montana. Oh, okay. And so in Montana, there were at least 10 different sites that we collected tree data from. Uh, it's amazing how many farmers, when you say, well, can you measure my, can we measure your trees? Oh yeah, that's fine. Can we cut one down? No way. <laughs> so, I mean, we had very limited people willing to let yeah, us bro. cut one of their trees you down. Go out in the middle of the night and cut it down? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we had tremendous help from the NRCS in the different areas of Montana. Yeah, so we've got at least 10 different counties in Montana and at least 10 different counties in Nebraska that that data came from. So that if that gets your site differences, yes. But in most cases, just one or two trees from each site. We were at the mercy of the landowner. Hey, don't ask for permission, just cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pay, yeah. I don't hey, uh, <laughs> need some firewood. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a kind of two-parter for you. So the first is, uh, just for clarification, the above ground biomass, is that from the stump up or from the uh, from the ground, the surface up? And uh, on that, for below ground biomass, um, based off of what you show, you'd expect below ground biomass might be different from, say, Jenkins. Um, do you have any intentions on addressing that portion of the tree? Yeah, well, let me get, first of all, they were from ground up. And I'll let William answer the yeah. below ground part, because he did do that. Okay, for the low ground, we use Jenkins uh, ratio. The one proportion of the low ground is in the above ground. We have coefficients in the same way we have here for estimate this proportion. This is the only <coughs> way we estimate this low ground biomass. Yeah. Okay. Do you think that those assumptions about the elementary and the, relative, the ratio component method might be different? Yeah, that we, Given what we, we, yeah, we need to, most people working on that because it will be very hard to use everything, but we need, we need this is our proposal, we need more people testing this value in a large range, for example, some people have 
And that is one thing to ask a rancher to cut down a tree, but then to dig a pit around the tree. So what was the ratio about the below ground of under us of time? Four of this, 23 percent. 30 percent. 23. 23. Yeah. Is that for pine and uh, hardwoods? Same for so for the no, no, it's different. What's the difference? Because uh, they have different coefficients in the ratio. You know the same. Oh, I know, but uh, what I'm saying is, you know, uh, what percentage uh, for uh, hardwood yeah, and uh, versus hard. yeah, hardwood is it will be 26, 27, but this is between 20 and 30. This is the ratio for all of these species. 20 and 30 percent. We've got five more minutes. If, uh, if no one has questions. Uh, I just want to bring up a comment. Um, Texas? Yes. Okay, you brought up the question about uh, the data for the crops. Jim Brandle, John Cord, well, I guess you're retired now, but the, the Canadians down to Oklahoma are involved in their plant wide reevaluation of uh, the effects of wind, uh, wind breaks on crop production. Because the last change, yes. you know, so you've got the change in corn uh, and all that, and we're, we're sort of relying on the farmers with their new, new GPS and uh, combine Cadillac system to do it. Uh, the work's sort of getting off the ground. Jim's been very instrumental in uh, sort of orchestrating it, sort of what the end central. It, it's slow because it's been all voluntary. It's mm -hmm. sort of like the regional clubs, some of those unfunded mandates, but it's something that we really need to be looking at. Maybe ask an advertisement. If any of you know any landowners willing to cooperate with us, we would love to get in touch with them. Most of them are extremely protective of their yield data. Yeah, nobody, no, wants, no. nobody wants to share that information. That was what I was kind of wondering. Cause we have some of that historic, but a lot of folks, well, that was then. What about now? And, and yeah, so if there's there's a. Uh, well, we've run that, we've yeah. we've run yield yield trials from from about 1975 until <laughs> last year, and we grow corn, soybeans, and wheat, and our wheat yields are up about 15 percent. Uh, some years it's 30 percent, some years it's one or two percent. We have that kind of variability, but our our average over that entire period has been about 15 percent for winter wheat. Uh, for corn, it runs about 12 percent. For soybeans, it runs around 16 or 17 percent. And these are with modern varieties. I mean, my farm manager chooses the best variety he possibly can every time because part of his salary comes from that. So he's got a vested interest. So yes, we have some data, but it's all from one place in eastern Nebraska. Yeah, I was just saying, in my area, it's primarily cotton is the, the, the primary commodity, so I don't know what, um, what I, research I don't know anything about cotton. You have my cotton stuff. Oh, you're not irrigating? Uh, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. You're in Texas? Yeah, love it. Okay. All right. Are there any wood okay. breaks in love it? We're working on it. <laughs> 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 That's about the only place you'll see one. You got the wind, right? Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that's my well, responsibility is getting the wind breaks. You're, you're, you're not. Somebody has time for <laughs> you just write it off and take profit. We've got time for one more question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of Let's go kill flat. What is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, you know, yeah, I'm about this that. is one. This is one tool for nobody's there. To evaluate the normality we have in that range of data, this allows us to okay. the observation has to be very close to this line. And we have we have some departure from this line. We have some concern with normality. And we want the, our data to be normal, otherwise we should that. So she has like probing? No, no, like a probing is only for a standardized of a data. No, 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 no. She avoids bias or something. Thanks, William.